chat. And I'll just go ahead and introduce myself and then turn it over to Terry and then to Kathy to introduce themselves. I'm Charles Ansel. Uh, I am the Vice President for Research, Policy, and Advocacy at Complete College America. Uh, we are one of the uh, founding partners of the Civic Learning and Democracy Engagement Coalition and uh, very honored to um, uh, discuss uh, this incredibly important topic with you and, and hope that you've been enjoying the forum thus far. Why don't I turn it over to Terry? I'm Terry Brown and I'm Vice President for Academic Innovation and Transformation at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, ASCU. And I'm here with my colleague, Kathy Copeland. Hello, I'm Kathy. I'm also from the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, and I serve as the director of the American Democracy Project. Um, and to answer Charles's other question, I'm place based in Virginia, um, although the American Association of State Colleges and Universities is based in DC as well. Um, so I will send it on over to Charles and we'll get started with our session. Excellent. And and I apologize for not taking my own directions. So I am place based here in Reno, Nevada, although Complete College America is based in Indianapolis. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. We've got a little bit of presentation that we wanna do, but we really want this to be a discussion. Uh, so as we kind of set the stage um, and, and uh, uh, share a few slides on, on what this session is about, uh, it would be wonderful if you have questions as we're going to go ahead and throw those um, into the chat, because again, we, we do hope to um, have a vibrant discussion um, uh, going after we uh, share a few slides. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hold on one second. Okay, and Kathy and Terry um, and uh, Matt volunteer, uh, I can um, see your faces. So do you see my screen? Excellent. All right. So for this session, um, you know, we we really want to build uh, on what's been uh, discussed at the convening thus far. You know, so far we've heard a tremendous amount of actionable insights, um, insights on how to move civic learning and democracy engagement forward and faster. And we've been been made aware over the sessions of so many uh, important interrelated national efforts to make these learning outcomes available and to work for all students, regardless of background. So this session, um, this concurrent session, we're gonna be building on these foundations, uh, building on that idea exchange on what works in practice and in policy to move forward on civic learning and democracy engagement across America. Um, and so, you know, to that end, um, I think it goes without saying that, you know, this is understating it, but that that we we live in a, in a politically fraught moment. Um, and I'll venture, however, that college completion and student success uh, really does, uh, at least as far in, in my experience, remains a largely bipartisan pursuit. It's bipartisan nature reflected on the right-hand side of this slide at the Complete College America Alliance map, um, which of course, you know, without going into C Complete College America and our model of engagement, you can see that we encompass red states and blue states and, and purple states. And I would say that, you know, one thing that unites uh, across party lines is, you know, knocking down the ivory tower conception of higher education, right? The one where college is built for a few and perpetuates the status quo. We, we all want to see dramatic increases in the number of students who can improve their lives through post-secondary education. We, we must have graduation rates at a higher level of excellence and they must be equitably gained without disparities by race or income background and graduation outcomes or in choice of major. So um, I'd also venture to say that because of all of this, higher education can be uh, something that bridges uh, partisan divides. So to that end, um, you know, for just this purpose and something that I believe has been made abundantly clear today and yesterday, um, the Civic Learning and Democracy Engagement Initiative is about making civic learning and post-secondary uh, education an outcome for all students, right? Um, you know, so this is just, you know, I, I won't spend time here because I, I believe everybody, you know, knows this, but just for stage setting, you know, this, we represent a coalition of organizations dedicated to building quality and equity in learning outcomes that include democracy engagement, that involves collaborative problem solving, that is committed to policy change that supports these goals. Um, because as much as college needs to be an engine for economic mobility, um, it must also be in service of the broader public good. You know, to, to that end, 
this is a quote from the Truman Commission, which explored and, and ultimately instigated the dramatic increase in higher education opportunity for all. And, and it, you know, the Truman Commission was actually not super concerned with job placement, with vocationalism, right? It was concerned with, you know, fighting communism. Uh, and, and the commission's findings, uh, which helped lead to the proliferation of higher education across the country, it emphasized general education. It emphasized promoting knowledge, knowledge for an informed citizenry, a, a strengthened citizenry, one that could ultimately, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, like out Sputnik the Soviets abroad while furnishing technology and humanities for a bountiful civic life at home. So today, when we think of the purpose of college, we tend to think about economic mobility. Um, but, you know, the, the conversations the past two days um, and the actions from the Truman Commission that instigated the dramatic increase in college going attendance in the 20th, 20th century, they came from something else. Um, so completing college matters, but it's not a good in itself. We are all in the business of making successful alumni and, and, and in doing so creating a healthy society. And to make post-secondary attainment appealing, we have to be comprehensive once more around the why for college completion. So this is not to say that college completion shouldn't abandon student aspiration, right? So you, you can't even have college completion without student aspiration. So college completion, and therefore from the position that I'm speaking from at Complete College America, is involved with the civic learning and democracy engagement precisely for this building of student aspiration, of student purpose. Um, so indeed, you know, about, about one in two students have specific career aspirations in forming their college journey with about two thirds expressing knowing the value or purpose of their education to completion. And yet three quarters of low income and first gen students leave without a job or ongoing education connected to their studies. And not depicted here, there is about a 50% a, a higher retention rate for students with declared programs of study in specific majors relative to those who, who don't have that. So what's interesting is that the very access to the general education that the Truman Commission viewed as so sacred in itself is stratified is is stratified. So, for example, many rural community colleges have many students who would be interested in various social science and humanities majors, but do not have the right resources or technical systems in place to offer all but the most survey of gen eds. And and it's hard to realize their purpose there, which impacts college completion. Um, we we almost have a meta democracy problem in which the very tenets of democracy engagement and civic learning are not themselves democratically offered, which implies that only some academic purpose is appropriate for some students and others for other students. And, and that's not where we want to be. So in other words, civic learning and democracy engagement in broadening access to these principles ends up promoting college completion, which in turn promotes more civic learning and democracy engagement in a, a virtuous cycle. So there, there was a session. Um, earlier um, about this in the forum, I just wanna recap some pretty important points um, uh, about this report that we learned about earlier, because if we're talking about post-secondary uh, attainment and its relationship to civic learning and democracy engagement, um, you know, we have to recap these findings that the American Association of Colleges and Universities, AAC, and you just released um, in their meta-analysis on the effects of community-based and civic engagement on higher education, which included 13 studies, um, that encompass college completion and retention outcomes, pointing to practices um, that involve collaborative pedagogies and learning environments that lead to higher credit accumulation rates, higher retention rates, um, and of course, higher completion rates. Um, and so with that, I, I don't wanna go into these questions right now. I'm about to turn it over um, to uh, my colleagues um, at AASCU uh, at ASCU. Um, uh, but these are questions that, you know, hopefully we engage with during the discussion uh, or any other questions or thoughts, or concerns or examples that are uh, coming to your mind on, on the current state of exposure of these um, learning outcomes, uh, especially at community colleges, as I alluded to earlier, um, the definitive links between college attainment and the virtues of civic learning and democracy engagement, and then what the resource implications are and what the challenges are for higher ed to um, uh, offer these. And, and then finally, like I just said, as, a, as kind of a broken record, what questions, ideas, and examples do you all have that we can bring to bear to, to foster um, conversation? So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna turn it over to ASCU, um, uh, and I believe to Kathy Copeland in particular.
thanks so much and i'm i'm going to reshare with a different screen here um and continue the the discussion um really where i think that uh, that charles has set us up perfectly which is um how do we start to understand what best practices are actually in place and i hope everybody can see my my new um uh, great excellent well i'll move on from there so um ASCU itself does a lot with civic engagement, um, but one of the strong branches is the American Democracy Project. And uh, within that, I'm going to share a little bit about what we do and then share some of the best practices that we've found throughout there. So the mission of ADP um, is that we're preparing students uh, with the knowledge, skills, and experiences to be informed and engaged global citizens. Um, that we're focused on um, ensuring a thriving and equitable democracy um, within that focus. One of the ways that we do this is by working together as a collaborative, collaborative uh, unit. So we have um, 48 states in the Bahamas, 300, over 300 campuses, and 2.7 million students. And at ASCU especially, we have a large number of HBCUs, HSIs, MSIs. So we are really trying to, um, to enter into that virtuous cycle that Charles um, described earlier, which is that we want the tenets of civic learning to be democratically implied. And so we are reaching the, the communities that most need it and finding a way to, to move the conversation forward there. So what exactly we do um, is a variety of, of things, um, and I'll kind of go through it and then hone in on some of the best practices that we found throughout there. We look at uniquely local, regional, and national programming, and, um, and that really allows us to both expand what what colleges um, and universities are doing and showcase their, their work, but also allows us to figure out ways that they can collaboratively work regionally and then that they can com communicate with each other on a national level. So one of our major areas of, of focus is with voter education and engagement. Um, in the past few decades, um, we saw that the number of students stayed the same and certainly our work throughout um, throughout all of this has been to um, to engage students and institutions to increase voter registration drives developing issue guides really where we found the most important focus is that um, that what we started to find out the key information about why students vote that they don't just vote along party lines but instead they base they base their vote on issues and this was found in um in clear resolve in the 2020 election where climate change and covid were the two drivers the main drivers of um, of the student voter registration and turnout um and I'll kind of move on to the next area that we focus in on, which is best practices from our campuses. Um, we try to lift up the best practices from our campuses that focus on um, on a variety of of completion and student learning, uh, civic learning outcomes. So, for instance, Tarleton State University, which I'll detail in more um, more a little bit later. Um, works to prove that civic engagement matters through retention and graduation rates of their Tarleton town halls. Um, UMBC's Center for Civic Engagement uh, shows a deep commitment to storytelling and focuses on improved interpersonal skills. Rutgers University Camden has a rich internship program, and they work to increase career exploration of public service jobs. And the University of Hawaii at Hilo's focus on the sustainability of community engagement to address authentic issues really builds their community and stronger educational pathways. Um, what we find is that there are a variety of ways that equity focused practices improve civic awareness, attitudes, skills, and dispositions, and that we need to find all of these elements and to vocalize them, to share them more widely so that we can really make a difference in showcasing where, where differences from communities are, um, are making a strong stand. We also have several different civic fellows within ADP, and these focus on um, 
on a variety of ways that faculty and staff are deeply engaging and finding out new information. So where new digital literacy practices can come from, how we understand institutionalization of democracy initiatives, voter education pathways and analysis. And they really help us um, dev devise new assessments and new resources that we can bring to the fact. Um, and then our, our largest gathering is the Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement Meeting, uh, which has a, a fun little acronym there, CLDE, which we may all hear about multiple times during this wonderful conference um, that we've been invited to. Our CLDE is um, in Boston this year from May 31st through June 2nd. And it's really the only place um, we are, we're, we are, we're so happy to, to host it with NASPA. And so it really opens up the ability for this conference to be the place where physically we bring all voices to the table, faculty, staff, students, administrators, and community members. Um, this conference allows us to create community. It allows participants to share their work and to gain new strategies, insights, and methods of encouraging a campus-wide investment in civic engagement. Where we have, we'd love to have individuals present, um, but we've found that whole groups coming um, coming to campus and, and every year each of our institutions challenges each other to see who can bring the most members there um, in order to have a, a great big group learning about it, bringing that information back and, um, and meeting back at their campuses to deploy their strategies of civic learning and democratic engagement. Where I wanted to focus in on how we're making an impact um, and to kind of show some, some examples and numbers, um, since that's what we love in our work there, assessments, um, I wanted to highlight the Tarleton State University Town Hall results. The Tarleton State Town Hall is a program that Eric Murrow, Morrow um, started there. And he has continued it with uh, significant input from his department, um, his provost, um, the faculty and staff there. They bring in um, about half right now of, of the freshman population and integrate them into what's called the town hall. Um, this is a series of classes where they practice democratic um, methods of, of discussion, where they have deliberative dialogues, um, they bring forward, um, Texas specific government policies and discuss them. And what they have found is they have been able to compare the town hall students to the non town hall students and to see that there's significant impact on retention, on persistence, and on graduation rates. This has been going on for about six years. This is their seventh year of doing the program. And they've been able to develop um, the kind of see the graduation rates and the retention rates there. But Eric Murrow um, also has a couple of um, publications coming out about this project. And that's really what we need to focus on, that this civic engagement work and especially gaining the numbers for it takes time. It takes it requires a lot of um, a lot of work from our faculty and staff and our administrators in order to gain this insight. And we need to figure out ways that we can make this assessment matter um, concretely throughout all of the universities and um, and colleges that we have um, in order to to present a more viable higher education picture of where of why this matters and and uh, and present our case even more broadly. I'll also say too, um, we have seen increased critical thinking scores. Um, this really developed from the Sam Houston State University um, Science for Citizens course, where they showed that a five point improvement on the CAT scores um, during that particular course. We've also um, seen the increased retention and graduation rates in other ways too, um, within the Global Challenges curriculum at Stockton University. Um, they showed that there was a first year retention rate of 93% compared to 80% for those who weren't in the course um, and a six year graduation rate um, difference as well. And that was a Global Challenges curriculum that investigated how global citizenry can actually make a difference in how people understand their communities and understand their persistence to graduate. Um, the 
the, the last thing that I'll, or the two last things that I'll focus on is, um, is increased student voter rates. It's not just about getting the numbers, um, which we are happy that they can go up to 85% at places like Metropolitan University of Denver, um, but it's also that the interest and in the education is being built. So we are having students create inf voter information guides to give to their peers on campus so that they have a greater understanding of the issues that are there, but the people that are involved. And we're having um, groups such as at um, James Madison University where they host candidate forums for both local and state candidates so that those people are actually coming to the campus can be um, discussed and, ha and have the students actually ask them questions where they live. And these types of exciting initiatives are really why we're driving to, to find that improved sense of awareness and efficacy of the way that they can make change happen um, on their campuses. Um, with all that, I'll move it over to my colleague, Terry Brown, to talk about what's next at ADP and at ASCU with this work. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, thank you, Charles, as well, for creating a, a, a context for a conversation that, that um, allows us to talk about the connection between civic learning, democratic engagement, and student success. Um, I uh, am happy to talk about the uh, next 20 years of the American Democracy Project. Um, I'm, I'm proud to say that I was I paid, played a small part in the, in the first 20 years at, at, at the beginning of the, the, um, the at the birth of, of the American Democracy Project 20 years ago. Um, I was uh, a, a professor of English on the campus of the University of Wisconsin River Falls. And I led the, um, the American Democracy Project as the first a chair of ADP on our campus and uh, learned right away and what I didn't know, um, which was uh, that uh, this kind of work could reinvigorate um, uh, not, not just students, but faculty as well. I found that a, quickly a community of faculty grew together across our disciplines with an interest in integrating civic learning into, uh, intentionally integrating it into our curriculum and, and uh, working with partners on campus in student affairs uh, and in the library. Librarians were, are, are very important to this work. Um, and then being connected through this network, this national network to uh, partners like the New York Times. Uh, they've been a, a partner since the very beginning. Uh, and um, I found that for me, this was incredibly invigorating work. And then I saw the changes uh, and witnessed the changes that it had in my classes and in the way that I was teaching. Um, I just say this because I want to uh, give a sense of my perspective as I now am in this position at ASCU overseeing this work, working with Kathy. Um, uh, what we what we know is that the last 20 years have been very successful in the way that we've measured it. Um, but we also know that uh, ADP was created 20 years ago at a very different time in the United States and a very different time for democracy. And it's we now find ourselves rethinking and reimagining and uh, rededicating in a way uh, to uh, this work. Uh, recommitting to um, the work of civic learning and democratic engagement, but um, knowing that it has to adapt and change so that it reflects this new landscape and the new challenges for democracy, um, particularly democracy in higher education. Uh, when we began this work 20 years ago, there weren't threats from state legislatures um, like there are today. Uh, we're, we're learning from some provosts who are saying, can we change the word and not use the word democracy? Because that's considered, considered contentious in my state. We didn't have that kind of conversation then. Now we realize that we have to look at this with uh, this work uh, with a, a, a new lens. So our work, first and foremost, I'm going to talk about four key ways in which we're um, 
uh, rethinking this, the work of the American Democracy Project for the next 20 years. First and foremost, our work must foreground equity and inclusion. It has to more explicitly and intentionally address the intersections of race and democratic engagement. Um, our white students have a very different experience and idea of American democracy than our black and brown students. And engagement for one can feel like alienation for another. And we need to understand that and recognize that. So recognizing this difference is important in serving students as individuals who bring different experiences to the college experience and to their experience as citizens. Uh, we've begun uh, th with a conversation with provosts from minority serving in institutions. This a series of conversations we had last year, this sym symposia were, uh, was supported by Lumina and the focus was on dem uh, democracy and America's racial reckoning. Uh, what we learned from this conversation was that our campus leaders need support in leading for democracy. Um, it is not, it, it's it, the, uh, the climate is, is treacherous in some states and um, our leaders are telling us that they don't necessarily have all the tools to understand uh, the uh, complexities of the free spe speech issues, for example, um, and uh, the political dimensions of this work beyond the campus. Uh, so we're working with the leaders and, and that's the second point I wanna make about this work. We, we, we will be focusing on leadership as a key to institutional transformation. And we're designing programs that help leaders lead for an equitable and just democracy. Our work to this point has involved provosts and presidents. In fact, uh, you cannot, a campus cannot join the American Democracy Project unless the president or the provost signs on. Uh, but we haven't necessarily provided leadership development to those campus leaders in this area. And while we have eight very strong leadership development programs for aspiring leaders and sitting presidents and provosts, we haven't yet integrated work on democracy into these programs and we'll be doing that. We'll also be designing an institute for campus leaders on leading for democracy. So focusing on equity and inclusion, uh, focusing on leadership as a fulcrum for institutional transformation on uh, civic learning and democratic engagement. And then, it, and with, do, while we do that work, helping campuses ensure that these efforts are part of a larger strategic effort rather than episodic or occasional celebrations of civic engagement and de democratic learning and uh, civic learning and democratic engagement. We have to ensure that the campus civic engagement effort, efforts are part of the larger, a larger commitment of the leadership and then broadly supported by faculty, staff, students, and integrated into the curriculum and the co-curriculum and connected with the needs of the region and the community. And then finally, we have to make sure that we're rigor rigorously assessing our, our efforts and able so that we're able to demonstrate and measure the impact. We need to be able to demonstrate that uh, there, the, the linkages between democratic engagement and student success, uh, as Tarleton has been able to do. And I think uh, Tarleton State University is a model for, for this kind of work uh, and for this kind of assessment. Um, we have some assessment, but we don't have the kind of extensive uh, Im impact data that we that we need. So that gives you an idea of what I think is called for in the next in the next uh, phase of our work uh, on the American Democracy Project. So that brings us, I think, to the questions that we've got. Yes, and um, thanks so much. What we wanted to do um, with Charles is that we've thought through a few questions. Charles presented a, a couple there. Um, I'll kind of reread all those questions that we had thought of 
And then, um, well, he put them into the chat, so I don't have to do that. That's great. Um, but what we can really do is um, is open it up for a conversation here. Um, if we find that that more people want to speak, we could also go into breakout rooms too. But what we're really interested in focusing on is where do you see evidence um, for linkage between this work and, and student success? Um, and as Charles talked about, what is the current state of exposure to learning? Um, are there definitive links that you see in your particular roles on campus um, and resources that that need to be present and, and aren't yet there or, or we haven't talked about them as much as needed? So I um, wanted to kind of open up the conversation to all of you to see what sorts of things are there um, and what you're thinking about. I wonder if people are willing um, to um, come off, uh, to, to go on camera to, to have a conversation. Um, I'm also wondering if the impression is, if others share the impression that we have more to do in assessing this work. Uh, Heather, yeah, feel free to go ahead. Well, I do think, and and Ashley's um, prior um, session reemphasizes that we don't have enough research out there. Um, but I have to say that I, that service learning has been around for a long time, and and so has civic engagement, at least in the writing field. Um, we've got. We have studies and work that's been done with public writing for a long time. Um, I will put a shout out though for this town hall idea and the research that seems to be gathered already from Tarl uh, Tarleton, uh, Tarleton University. I remember hearing about this back at an ADP um, conference years ago and wanting to bring it to campus. And I now as the director of Gen Ed, <laughs> intend to introduce this concept to the provost because I do believe this brings what we've been trying to do, which is get students to speak thoughtfully and with foresight and with um, you know, a sense of organization and good speaking skills about the issues that are, are involved in our state, um, state or national issue. And, and there's, a, there's a great format. I've just been looking at that website for doing this. So I thank you for that. And I, I hope that we'll contribute to the research that's ongoing. No need to reinvent the wheel. That's right. And there's so many, so many ways that we can continue to talk to each other so that we don't have to, to work from ground zero. David. Thank you. I, I, I second <clears throat> Heather's enthusiasm for the idea of a town hall project. I wonder if we might uh, benefit from taking this more broadly too, that if we think about uh, policy issues, uh, while that's an absolutely legitimate and should be a protected realm of speech for students and faculty alike, uh, there are problems uh, that have been noted in some areas. Uh, but if we think about uh, the self-selection of student activity off campus in service learning opportunities, uh, and the need in many respects to universalize this, right? To make it affordable for all students, to make that participation not simply a matter of volition, uh, but something that is integral to the curriculum and that extends beyond political areas. Uh, there have been many mentions throughout this conference in urgent social needs and partnerships with nonprofit organizations, uh, which can address homelessness, which can address food desert desertification, transportation issues, healthcare access, et cetera, um, all of which certainly have contentious political dimensions to them, but also have very hard empirical empirical realities uh, that are in some ways pre-political. I realize nothing is pre-political, but to the extent that I can say that. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that we're trying to do here with a very soup to nuts uh, revision of the core curriculum uh, at Kane is to try to base that inquiry and experiential platform into every discipline and require each discipline to do that. But I just wonder uh, from the perspective of those experts gathered here, uh, if this notion of broadening it so that it isn't just framed as civic, but there are civic outcomes with a number of different areas and adjacencies 
of, of access. Um, I, I, if I could, I would like to hear what others say, what Charles and Kathy would say to this, but I think that that is essential and that may be the next 20 years and what we'll see is, because I, my sense is that sometimes when we talk about civic, that it can be because of the way our disciplines are divided can then sometimes be seen as, well, that's what happens in that corner over in political science. Um, and, and though, uh, Heather, I'm glad to see that you're here and there's others in other disciplines. And I, I think that, um, that, that it'll be very important to take a very broad view of this work in order for it to be um, successful. It can't just exist in uh, the social sciences and the humanities. Um, so I, I, I appreciate that comment. Yeah, I would just echo what Terry's saying, uh, including the whole idea of me not talking so other people will talk, but, um, you know, cause I'm curious if, you know, um, I, I thought what you said, David was so well stated. Um, you know, I, I'll just say, I, I think that that has to be the goal like capital T because, um, you know, I, there, there's so, you know, little exposure, you know, my, my professional background is at the community college level. And, you know, very often um, there uh, was, was not this, um, uh, you know, the, the, this type of uh, material and learning, um, you know, and, and, and even if you wanted to major in it, um, it, sometimes the major just couldn't even be offered because there was no, um, the, the financials didn't work out. And so, you know, I, I just want to, you know, echo that I, I think what it sounds like you're doing is, is exactly right. And, and I'm curious, you know, if, if others um, have similar stories or trying similar endeavors. And, and I'd also be curious, David, like how it's going and what sort of roadblocks you're hitting. I, mean, I would too. I'll be happy to talk about that, but we'd love to hear from others first. Good afternoon. Um, I can say um, I'm Pam Ray with uh, Texas Lutheran University in Seguin, Texas. So um, I'm looking at it now from a student affairs lens. I actually started on the faculty side and I actually started at a community college. Then I went to a university, big four-year university research-based. Now I'm here at a smaller university, um, religious-based, uh, small town, yet still, you know, big on the whole idea of service learning. So one of the things I know, which is not new, but one of the things that our university did, they combined service learning and career development into one department. So looking at how both can support each other and make that connect and allow our community partners to also help our students understand the importance of what they're doing at this level um, and how their service learning skills when they graduate and move into a career and how that looks in the area of philanthropy is not just about raising money, it's more than that. So what has occurred at your service learning um, level, one of the things I want to look at is what skills have really been enhanced and are they looking for employers that have this as a part of their mission um, in their organization? So that's something we've been talking about, really, really studying to make sure to look at the career aspect of it. So when students do um, start preparing for a career and looking at jobs and looking at companies. Are you looking at the civic, you know, engagement of that company? Is that company out in their community? Because that says that's an investment in you as well as an employee. Those are some of the things we're looking at. Hope I answered the question. Thank you for that. Shall I uh, answer the question, Charles, that uh, you proposed and Terry that you seconded? <clears throat> Actually, I saw Elaine 
went off mm -hmm. mute for like a nanosecond. And then after that, I would like to throw it uh, back to you, David. Thanks, Charles. Lane Ward, um, Merrimack College. Um, great to see you all. Um, Terry, I came on camera when you asked us to, and because some of your comments um, around assessment and the, the best practices at that institution that you mentioned, um, I want to make sure that I capture the name of it correctly. And then I'm just wondering if you could share a little bit, because we're we've been able to get um, civic learning um, outcomes into our institutional learning goals here at Merrimack College. Um, we've been able to start having conversations, hard conversations about community engaged learning and scaffolding it across the curriculum and not just in the uh, uh, first year um, courses. And my goal is to try to help embed it across the disciplines in the majors and then into career development. Um, and the assessment piece is, is still parked, right? Until we figure some of these other bigger pick pieces out. And so I'd love to just hear some more details on, you know, embedding it across the disciplines and then really strategies uh, that are working for assessment at multiple levels across the institution. Um, so thank you. Kathy, do you want to give some examples there? Sure, um, I can I can work on that. And I would say, um, Elaine, your the the way that you've been approaching it is is often how how everyone else has been that that we're trying to kind of build build the boat and wait for the assessments afterwards. Um, and and that that model um, can get a lot of work done, but it isn't sustainable and it doesn't. Um, it doesn't bring the pieces to um, to the puzzle to allow this work to continue to get um, more buy-in from institutions. So, what I would say is is very important is that um, that several different um, institutions have have approached us with asking how we can how presidents and provosts especially can have the the data in there in order to to prove so like the AAC and U report that that Charles mentioned earlier and that was um, on an earlier session those types of things are vital and starting to align their their ongoing work with which civic dispositions which civic skills is is paramount um, to kind of take an overall landscape analysis of what your institution's doing and um, what areas are being covered. And that does require that you kind of push into the disciplines and find, find the work that's being done and start to coalesce it together into, into a framework that works. Um, we have been, ASCU has been working with collaboratory um, quite often to, to as, a, as a, basically as a means to help institutions figure out how to, uh, how to, how to gather the various community relationships that are ongoing, and to and to thread it into into something that makes sense for the institution, so that uh, physics professors aren't talking to the same group, um, aren't talking to the same community people that um, that Spanish professors are, and and that they don't have that they don't know uh, what's going on in their institution. So I would say those types of of interactions of finding what that landscape analysis is, and then starting to bring it into how can we understand what the institutional commitment to civic engagement is. And, and that does often connect to what is, what's the money that's, that's being um, allocated, how is it being organized, and what's the structure on campus. So um, understanding if you have an office of civic engagement or an office of service learning, um, how those how those are working together is, um, is I think a critical first step in, in doing a kind of institutional assessment of where your civic engagement is and what, what parameters you need to gather in order to, to create um, that kind of larger picture. But okay. Terry, do you wanna consider with some of the, the information that we found from student success parameters too? Um, you mean speak to the, which part of it? Uh, well, no, that's all right. <laughs> um, I, maybe Elaine, does that start to answer your question? Yeah, no, that? it's it 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 is helpful. Um, it it is helpful, and you know, I think there's 
developmentally, some of this stuff moves forward and comes back right at different phases. And so trying to get everything moving together and harnessing and Absolutely. getting it to move together at the same time in the same direction um, it has been an, an interesting conundrum at our campus over the last few years, particularly when there's been competing priorities. So the institution is, is making great strides forward um, and then maybe a couple of steps back, and then we're trying to nudge it forward again. And so for me, some of the questions, okay, you know, is is just a reminder of these things that some of us already know, and how not to give up on it and just keep it moving forward as much as possible. And or for me, the other piece is succession plan and how do leaders in this work on campus get others lined up behind them to help carry the work forward, right, um, and sustain it over time. Um, do you, Elaine, do you feel like your faculty, staff, and students all have a clear idea of what um, a, a civically engaged student and graduate looks like? No, not okay. yet. So not if you, yet. I mean, yeah. one thing is having that vision mm -hmm. and then hearing it over and over and repeating it Great. over and over so you you've now absorbed that as that's what we're working toward. Great. Thanks. Thanks so and, much, Sherry. Thanks, say, Kathy. Keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> I think, David, I wonder if you could speak to that as well. Sure. I'd be happy to say that, but let me also speak as a fairly new provost, uh, uh, 18 months into the role, and how important data support would be for me. And one of the key applications of, of the data support would be in convincing faculty that this is something that actually makes a very big difference in their students' lives. Um, we, uh, we're in the midst, as I mentioned, of a, of a major overhaul of our, uh, of our core curriculum. Um, and, and I think this speaks to a certain extent to Elaine's question about how you keep this alive and how you drive it into all the corners of the university. Um, but we start with three principles. Principle number one, and apologies to Heather, who heard some of this in an earlier session today, uh, but uh, we'll, I'll, I'll try to make it a little different. Uh, principle number one is that we, we assume as a point of argument, rebuttable presumption, that the worst way to offer instruction is in a classroom. Uh, and that that may be wrong for many disciplines, but you have to justify why it is that you want to go back in the classroom. Number two, that every discipline can find fresh data, fresh encounters, people to report your findings to out in the world and wide, and that one or another of those modalities would be available to you, whether you're a biologist, a geneticist, uh, a, a uh, somebody studying business law, uh, whatever it might be, and that that is all susceptible to treatment in the core curriculum. Number three, that we want to foreground the experience that students have in their daily lives as a platform for backing into academic disciplinary armatures for examining phenomena, um, so that we start with what interests them literally on their walk from the train into campus. We have a New Jersey transit rail stop right on our campus. Um, and so as they come from that station into the university, they see the Elizabeth River and its damaged environmental condition. They breathe the air that is uh, uh, compromised by vehicular traffic and other uh, point pollution sources. Um, they have soil that has been contaminated uh, and graded one of, I, I, I'm not making a very good argument for Kane University, but this is both endemic throughout Northern New Jersey, uh, that has been rated uh, most in need of cleanup by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. So what we want students to do in getting their basic biology, their basic chemistry, all the rest, and believe me, I'm not gonna walk you through everything that we're doing in this germ germinal phase, uh, but is to take soil samples, water samples, air samples, Soil and water are very easy to do. Air requires collaboration with the municipality. So those burgeoning chemists and biologists would have to know what it means to work with a civic organization. Of course, the professors in the university will do most of that work, but they'll know it's important that they have to report back to the civic leadership each year uh, to, to, to explain what they found in their, in, in their air monitoring stations. Um, and I could go on with uh, health disparities, different access to primary care physicians, different access to educational opportunities, uh, different access to small business ownership by race, ethnicity, gender, veteran status, et cetera, um, and, and pose these problems as a way to walk back into statistical analytics, as a way to walk back into writing 
and keep their writing classes focused on each one of these laddered experiences from September 1st when they arrive on campus through May 18th or thereabouts when they end their second semester. Uh, the, the, the challenges that we're facing at this stage is basically, and, and we're, we're targeting implementation for fall of 2024. Uh, so we're still very early phases of what all of this is gonna look like. We're trying to move off of the three credit class give people modules that will be differently credited based upon how consistently are they are woven through the curriculum, have the engagement piece at least of the report out, but ideally of involvement with institutions and individuals in the community, and getting professors to think in terms that are not 15 week, two times a week course instructions in Heinz Hall room 302. Uh, that is the single biggest challenge. And that then, uh, I'll, I'll end where I started, uh, having the data to show this makes a huge difference. And some of those data that you shared earlier, where you have 150% bump in graduation rates, uh, and I believe it was 125% bump, don't hold me to that, I'm just remembering your slides, uh, in uh, persistence rates, that's incredible. So uh, that's the kind of thing that can turn these arguments and get people to uh, let go of some of their taken for granted. And I think that was an illustration in your remarks uh, David, of a campus leader could, who could clearly art, articulate a vision for what the engaged student looks like and why and connect it with the local, which I think is another dimension of this, to really be clear about the place that you occupy and the difference that you make with your choices in that, that place. And uh, I know you're a, an ASCU member and you uh, have a, a commitment to serving your region. And I know that other institutions, including private institutions have the same, but I think that uh, the way you did that was just um, exactly what I think needs to be needs to happen on campus is to move people. Well, thank you for that vote of confidence. I want to underscore you're entirely uh, correct. We really start with that, that the insistence on the local, that it must be place based and that leads to all of these adjacencies and the introductions to people and institutions that make a difference in the students' lives on an ongoing basis. Great. I think I'd like to know whether or not there's other examples out there or ideas out there, uh, uh, other thoughts about this uh, connection between civic learning and student success. And can I throw I can in a companion? We didn't talk about this 20 years ago when we first started talking about civic engagement. And can I throw in a companion question there, Terry? Yes, yes. You know, sure. maybe, um, I, and I want to say, I mean, yeah, I, I'm very interested in what you just asked as well. And and I'm curious too, if somebody also has an example of, um, you know, Terry, you mentioned, you know, things are different than 20 years ago. And you said um, that at some colleges and some states, um, you can't say democracy or, or um, you know, I know at CCA, we, we've hit that problem with the word equity um, uh, as much as democracy for sure. Um, and curious if um, if folks have examples of that and how, how you handle that. But if, you know, maybe Terry's question is more relevant or easy, so that also works. Maybe it's not as contentious out there as I thought. <laughs> We've had a problem with the word liberal for liberal studies, liberal arts, but it seemed like that died down um, and, and didn't affect any change other than getting people upset a little bit. Um, I can speak to some of the local work that we are fortunate to be able to do here at Longwood. And we um, are partners with a local museum that is dedicated to a student leader. Um, our patron saint, or we should say patron hero, is Joan of Arc, which is a nice um, female representative role model. But our second one and, and closer to our students' age was Barbara Johns, who was a 15-year-old who started a strike for the poor student uh, educational conditions here in the county. Fast forward 
And after her three week strike, students went back to school, but the county deemed that they would close all public schools rather than integrate. And they closed them for five years. Um, and so um, educating students about her work as an American citizen and as, I, as a role model for American citizenry has motivated a lot of the work that happens in our general education program. And so we're lucky to have that role model to, to invigorate students, but also have them thinking about speaking out about issues in their own lives. Then that has spun out into uh, work with the local museum that's within walking distance. It's, it's literally on the blueprint of our campus. Um, interviewing local citizens who were affected by the school closings, whether they were strikers in 1951, we still have some of those people who joined Barbara John's effort, but then we have the students who in 1959, hers was, her strike was in 51, in 59 to 64, who are still here, white and black, young and old, and the students have been able to record their stories, then transcribe them, turn them into stories. Student photographers have been taking the pictures and we've produced five volumes of magazines through our general education program and classes. Um, and so that has been a representative, but I cannot say that we've had the whole scale that David was talking about that I also then want to emulate for our, for our program that is a whole scale change about the way that we think about these students and what they're doing. I agree, we've got to get them the minute they come off out of the car and out of the bus or however they have arrived and to use their 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 inquiry skills from the minute they step on campus because they are curious about what's going on and what's going to happen with their future and it strikes me that David's program um, and the university's program harnesses that energy and I've seen it in the classroom but then we have to get back to our regular study um, and it's, it does them such a disservice. So I applaud you, David. Um, I didn't mind hearing about it again. And in fact, I think I heard more than you shared before. So I could I could hear it a third time. And thank you for sharing your um, your your work within that, Heather. Too. Um, I'll say too. I mean, we've seen differences between how people use civic engagement and community engagement based on that word choice too, or the rhetoric um, behind it. And I think it's important as we kind of look to the future, because I know we've got one minute left, so only one minute to the future there. But um, but we do want to be thoughtful of how our leaders on campus, all sorts of leaders, can really figure out what the civic engagement persona is that they want their students to um, to emulate and and to find ways, creative ways, nuanced ways, um, community-based ways to get those those um, those excited students um, excited about where they can be and how they can um, associate with the democracy. And I know Matt is telling us right now that we have to start to wrap up. So I'll I'll send it to Terry or Charles if either of you have last minute things. But I wanted to thank all of you for being here and um, and for in, in, in engaging this conversation with us. I don't have anything last minute. Um... Well, I'll say that um, Askew is uh, very uh, glad to be working with CCA and uh, to be part of this conversation here. And uh, we hope to continue to um, foster this kind of dialogue through our CLDE conference in, in June, but um, in many other ways too. So, and everyone's invited to this work because we need everyone doing this work. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Terry, when um, in 2016, I, when I moved from a public institution to a private faith-based institution, I was never so happy when ASCU and NASPA came together uh, oh, around this work because I could find my way back to that home That's again. That's right. That's and, right. Yeah. And I designed my graduate civic engagement and higher ed class for student affairs practitioners around oh, the theory of change. Wonderful. So, that's, yeah. That's Thank wonderful you for your work. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, Elaine. Take care all. Okay. Elaine, hope we see you in Boston this year. Yeah, I I I absolutely will.
See you. Okay. Hey, Wonderful. Elaine, what, what, public in, what, what public institution were you at? U, UMass you Boston. I was there oh. for 10 years. I studied with John Saltmarsh and Dwight Giles. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah. A good friend. Yeah. Matt, great to see you. 